Hey everybody, Gregory Connolly here with another edition of the Your Video Store Shelf podcast here at yourvideostoreshelf.com. On the show today, we have a guy who, his days in film are, it seems to be, long over, and he was a big part of the wonderful company that was City Lights and PM Entertainment, especially in the early days. Richard Munchin, how you doing? Uh, doing very well, thank you. And uh, now that I asked that question, are you um, ever looking to get back into film? Um, yeah, I, I am. If the, if the right situation came along, uh, I just uh, you know, like like most people who are in a business that is also an art, um, many of them uh, enjoy what they do, but really don't like the business end of what they do, and, uh, and, and that was the case with me. I, I've been very much in control of my life, and in film business, or in any of the arts, uh, you know, you're not in control of what you work, and uh, so while I very much like making films, I very much dislike the process of trying to find an agent and pitching projects that are just never going and you especially did take control of your life, because aren't you a professional uh, blackjack player? Um, yeah, I I uh, <laughs> I always needed a reliable income because the film was you know um, so, uh, up and down. So my reliable fallback job was a professional. Game. And uh, considering PM was based in Las Vegas, I guess that that didn't hurt you in the first uh, before you moved out to uh, California. Actually, that's not true. Uh, PM uh, originally City Lights. Uh, it started uh, the first offices were in uh, Van Nuys, California. And uh, uh, I, I'm sorry, I remember. I did now that I remember. I remember Paul Volk, the editor, um, telling me about how you guys were across the street from Hollywood Video, the porn company. Yeah, that that's true. And uh, um, but uh, Joseph um, what, had been living in Las Vegas, which is where I knew him. We were at acting school. Uh, so that that was the Vegas connection. Both lived in Vegas. Uh, and let's hear a little bit about the career of Richard W. Munchkin, because I imagine that sadly uh, most of the people listening to this aren't all that familiar with you. <laughs> Sadly, um, uh, well, uh, where do you want to start? <laughs> um, let's hear about just you got your start with okay, Joseph well, Murphy. Um, let me back up just a oh. little bit. I, originally, um, I went to Columbia College in Chicago with a degree in theater, and my intent was to come out here and become an actor. And um, when I got here and started you know, looking for acting work, uh, Joe, we moved here at about the same time, and Joe had chosen a different different path, which was to, uh, you know, he wanted to make films, and um, so when he did eventually, uh, you know, put together to make films, uh, we were good friends, and so I was there helping him. And in my own case, I found out very quickly that. Um, acting in film and television and commercials was very different than my experience doing stage, and I found out that I didn't, I really didn't like it. Um, it was not the same and did not offer the same rewards, so I happened to be in the right place at the right time and kind of shifted over into the you know, production side of film instead of being in front of the camera. Um, so um, you know what I let's see. Well, what when, happened was Joe oh. made a film, uh, Hollywood in Trouble, which I acted in, and uh, from that, um, Rick Pepin, who was the director of photography, he was the cinematographer, I guess, or the the camera operator who became the cinematographer on that first film. <laughs> yeah, that's a uh, wonderful story. Yeah, yeah. Um, the the original DP got fired, and Joseph had hired Rick, knowing that he might be firing the DP. And sure enough, that happened, and and so uh, Rick ended up finishing the film. 
Um, and what happened was Rick's, that film was a comedy, Hollywood in Trouble, which um, Joe was unable to sell. And uh, But he was in the right place at the right time. It was just the very, very beginning of the video boom. People were just starting to get VCRs in their homes. And um, Rick had been making swimming uh, tapes, 8-millimeter, 16-millimeter swimming films for a guy with a sports company in Canada. And Rick showed it to the guy, and the guy said, you know, wow, if you can make a film like this for $70,000... Um, I'll put up the money, you know, we'll form a company, I'll put up the money to make four more films, and, um, uh, but we have to make action movies, because that's what everybody wants to buy. Um, and, and that was how City Lights was formed. So, um, and, and I was just sort of there as a friend. I mean, I, I had nothing to do with the company, I was just, you know, a friend of Joe's, and, uh, you know, it was this new thing, and we were just having fun, in my mind, you know. It was like, oh, this is cool. Let's do this, you know. Um, so anyway, when City Lights was formed, they we did the first four movies, and the partner, the money guy, said, yeah, let's keep doing them. I think we made eight or nine movies the first year. We just started cranking them out, and, and I was <laughs> I was kind of the... Uh, production manager slash art department slash uh, wardrobe department slash, you know, caterer. Um, <laughs> at least on the first film. On the first film, I think the crew was only seven or eight people. And, um, uh, you know, it was sort of learn as you go. I mean, I mean, Rick, Rick really knew his job. He'd been shooting for a long time. And we had a, a professional sound man. Um, but the rest of us really, you know, I mean, it was kind of on-the-job training. So I, I – and, and each film we would add a few more crew people. So I wasn't trying to do all those things, um, you know, on the subsequent films. But um, uh, so I did, I, I think, seven or eight films that way. And then Joe gave me the opportunity to write and direct. And I, I was the first person, um, other than Joe, to uh, direct for the company. Yeah, you got that um, that little piece of notoriety because Joe, for the first, I believe it was twelve films or ten. Actually, yeah, I think you you cited it as in the email that we uh, exchanged. I think we figured out that it was like nine films uh, that Joe produced, directed, and typically wrote in a coffee shop the day before. Um, <laughs> That's, for that yeah, first that's year, true. and yeah, I would often help Joe with the writing, and and we would. Um, he had a little one bedroom apartment in Glendale, California, and uh, you know we would uh, go sit in his house in the morning and work, and then we would go walk in the Glendale Galleria, which was uh, a block away, and uh, and there was a particular coffee shop too on Colorado Boulevard that was uh, <laughs> that was popular. Um, and what's notable really about Joe is that a lot of people that wind up producing a lot of movies before they started producing, they were actually doing something within the film industry. Joe actually took that whatever amount of money, $50,000, $70,000 that he took to make Hollywood in trouble, and that was his first experience really on a film set aside from um, hanging out. At a few different sets. That's true. Um, Joe, uh, as I say, we were in acting school in Las Vegas, and we moved to uh, L.A. in 83. And Joe spent a lot of time just hanging out on movie sets, trying to learn everything he could. Um, so, um, yeah, so he really had no experience. He, he owned uh, three pizza places in Las Vegas, and, um, you know, that was his prior experience. And also, it's really kind of amazing that this guy who has written, uh, I don't know how many writing credits he has to his name, 30, 40, <laughs> something, uh, you know, English was not his first language. Um, you know, he came over from Syria um, when he was young, I mean, I mean an adult, um, in his 20s. And, uh, you know, so... 
yeah, he had no experience in the film business. English was a second language, and yet, you know, here he's made whatever, 100 movies and written 30 or 40. Or... Pretty amazing story. So when we get started in the business, it's like 1986 or so, and Hollywood and Trouble's in the can, and then you ca- here comes, um, God, I forget. Damn was the first one. Yeah, here comes Mayhem with the money from the Canadian guy whose name is slipping my mind right now. Um, Ron Gilchrist. Yeah, Ron Gilchrist, who I have not been able to track down. Um, I think he was from Toronto. Either He's Canadian, so um, and I can't remember the name. He had a sporting goods company. I can't remember the name of it. Oh, okay. Well, we'll figure it out off the air. So with Mayhem, you guys are told that the world wants action. So you guys went out there and produced an action film. And Mayhem, to this day, lives on in my heart as a special kind of movie. <laughs> uh, why is that? What was that? Just because it features Ray Martino in his largest role, pretty much. And he screams at a cat at one point in the movie. That's going to be up on YouTube soon. It's a tremendous, tremendous clip. And then just all the wackiness, like Ray Martino sticking a sawed-off shotgun up um, Gene Levine's dress and blowing it. Oh, yeah. Um, and what else was there in good old mayhem? And it was all justified because, of course, they were child pornographers or something. They were, they were, <laughs> dope, they were dope pushers and child molesters, and that's child just molesters. wrong. <laughs> and, you know, you always – I. The first time I watched that, I was so confused because usually the point of the bad guy in the beginning scene is that they're not as bad as the bad guys that they're soon going to encounter (laughs) because you just – all you're doing there is you're killing off the movie early. But it didn't matter that Joe was necessarily doing that because – when people would pop in the movies to see, do we want to buy this and sell it in Eastern Europe? They only were going to, they were going to be the most impressed by the first 10, 15 minutes. And as a result, there was always action to be had. Oh yeah. Uh, there, this was, um, you know, there was a very much a formula, which, you know, started out with, you must have a big action scene at the beginning and then there must be some kind of action every at least every 10 minutes and as the company progressed the action had to get closer and closer together and bigger and bigger <laughs> uh, although the biggest scene was usually the for the opening of the movie um and uh, uh and another thing that that sort of became odd was um uh the foreign market just had some very strange ideas about film, and I remember one time uh, George, who was who later became the guy who sold the movies in the foreign market, came and said, "The movie looks cheap. It's all shot at night." <laughs> and we explained to him that it's actually more expensive to shoot at night because you need much more lights, and and you know we thought that was a better, more interesting look. No, 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 no. It looks cheap if it's shot at night. <laughs> so. Um, uh, this was, of course, direct fruit feedback from buyers, but um, uh, yeah, I, I that was so long ago. But I remember that movie on that movie Mayhem. We again, you know, it was the first time we had ever dealt with stunts or special effects, and in an effort to save money, and these movies were always about saving money. So um, Mayhem, I think, was shot in seven days. Um, we we would order the equipment for one week and we would tell them that we're starting very early on Monday morning. So we have to pick up the equipment Friday afternoon. (laughs) And that allowed us to shoot from Friday afternoon for nine straight days, you know, and then return the equipment on that following Monday morning. And, uh, but, but, uh, in the case of mayhem, I think we finished a day or two early, um, you know, just because every day earlier that Joe finished would be one less day he had to pay the crew. 